Anne Applebaum is here with me. She writes for The Atlantic. She's a historian and political analyst. And what do you take away from this Munich Security Conference? I take away that there is real unity in the West, that um, Americans, Germans, the British, um, the French, uh, the European Union are all on the same page. Um, they've agreed that there will be very harsh sanctions on Russia if there's an invasion of Ukraine. Um, there's a tacit agreement that some NATO countries, some Western countries will be supplying weapons to Ukraine. Um, I also take away the fact that the Ukrainians feel this isn't enough. Um, President Zelensky made a speech that was in which he made clear that he's grateful for what's been done. Um, but at the end of the day, Ukraine is alone. Um, and it will really be up to the Ukrainian army uh, and the Ukrainian public um, to repel what could be a very large invasion. And so the, the disconnect between those two views um, gave a little bit of dissonance, I think, to this event. It was a very passionate speech by Vladimir Zelensky, quite clearly a man who's very much under pressure, who took also a great risk coming here because he was advised by Joe Biden he, he really shouldn't come, he shouldn't leave the house unguarded. Um, he did take that risk and he called out the West really to give him a timeline, ideally, for security. He wants security, he doesn't simply want aid. Is he going to get that anytime soon? He will not get a Western military invention, uh, intervention. Um, there is no consensus in favor of American or European um, boots on the ground, as we say in English, um, soldiers in Ukraine, you know, fighting with the Ukrainians. That's not going to happen. Um, he may get military aid. He's had quite a lot of it already in the last few weeks. Um, and he will get on his behalf these very harsh sanctions of Russia. Um, but at the end of the day, the, 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 this war will be decided, if there's a war, will be decided based on what the Ukrainians themselves do. Um, and it may well be, actually, that Putin has really underestimated Ukraine. Um, he doesn't know Ukraine well. He has many, you know, kind of misapprehensions about it. Um, in this famous essay that he wrote last mm -hmm. summer, Putin wrote a long essay describing Russia's relationship with Ukraine. He, he, was, he proved himself rather ignorant, actually, of Ukrainian history as the Ukrainians understand it. Um, and I do think there's a, there's a willingness to fight. And even if the, um, you know, the initial battle is lost, it will not be at all easy for Russia to stage some kind of occupation of Ukraine, if, if that's still what's in his head. You've written extensively also on the whole Cold War. You, you mentioned this kind of view of Vladimir Putin that that past, the post-Soviet past, was a historical mistake that he wants to fix. At what kind of historical moment are we right now? So Putin is someone who was deeply affected by the collapse of the Soviet Union and the collapse of the Soviet Empire in 1989 and 1991. He's himself said this and written about it. He considers it a great mistake and a disaster. He's also someone who is very anxious about, even obsessed with, um, democracy rhetoric, democracy activism, um, the kinds of moods and emotion that brought people onto the street in Leipzig um, and Berlin in 1989 and led to the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, the kinds of demonstrations that led to the collapse of the um, pro-Russian dictatorial president of Ukraine in 2014. He's afraid of those kinds of movements coming to Russia. He sees himself at war with democracy and with the democracies. Um, he perceive, we, we don't perceive him as an ideological enemy, but he perceives us that way. And for him, Ukraine is really the symbol of this. You know, Ukraine is a country that he thinks should be Russian or absorbed into Russia or close to Russia. He sees that Ukrainians want something different. Um, they want to be a sovereign democracy. They want to trade with the West. They want to be integrated into Western institutions. And for him, this is a line too far. Um, this is really not about NATO. The NATO is a distraction. This is about Putin wanting to protect his own power and his own political system. You know, he, he is a one-man autocrat. You know, he runs a kleptocracy. Um, the system is set up so that he and his close contacts um, not only rule Russia, they own most of the larger Russian companies, they profit from them. They want to keep that system in place, and they perceive uh, democratic activists, anti-corruption activists, 
um, uh, you know, any 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 um, any any street movements, any public movements, any public sentiment as a threat to them. And so the attack on Ukraine and the de the decision to destabilize Ukraine, which has already begun, it's already underway, um, is really part of that. It's about protecting his own position and his own power. Can you make any kind of prediction of what? playbooks are on the table right now, how this could turn out? Well, there we know the Russian playbooks because they're the Soviet playbooks, and we've seen them before. I mean, in, invade a country, put in a puppet government. You know, they did that in 1945. Uh, you know, we've seen that in, in, in East Germany, in Poland, and in, in, in Hungary in those years. Um, more recently, we've we've seen him, you know, go into, he went into Georgia. In Georgia, he didn't, um, he didn't uh, capture the capital, but he went in, he destroyed all the military installations, he took some land and left. That's, by the way, another scenario um, that he might be considering. Um, so we know what he does. We've, you know, we've seen this many times, and he hasn't been all that subtle in denying that he would do it again. So, so one of the reason that um, particularly American leaders are, um, are worried is because they, they know what he does. They have intelligence that says he's at least considering trying it again. Um, and, you know, in the past, those kinds of Uh, those kinds of invasions have left many people dead and created a lot of destruction. Vladimir Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, basically accused the West of appeasement in the past in relation to Russia. From the conversations you've had, also talking to hearing European leaders here, what kind of state is Europe in and what kind of state are transatlantic relations Europe, in now? Europe feels very unified. Um, People are saying the same thing. Um, there were a couple of very good, very powerful speeches here. The American vice president was very good. Um, the German chancellor was very good. The, Ger the German uh, foreign minister was very good. Um, but, but it amounts to the West saying, we are unified in support of you. Um, we are going to put the harshest sanctions on Russia there have ever been, um, but we will not fight for you. Um, and so at the end of the day, it's going to be up to the Ukrainians to fight for themselves. And they will fight. Um, and the question is whether their kind of warfare, which will look much more like asymmetric guerrilla warfare, um, will be enough to stop a very sophisticated Russian army. So what kind of phase are we entering into now in this conflict? Is this so, going to be with us months, years, decades? What's your expectation? So I think the Russian assumption is that it would be very fast you know, and the war would be over very quickly. And for all I know, that, that could be true, the main part of the fighting, but the Ukrainian resistance that will be real and will last indefinitely um, will make any kind of occupation of Ukraine or any kind of Russian domination of Ukraine extremely difficult. And so we could be in for a very long-term, um, you know, kind of guerrilla war that lasts Uh, for a long time, and of course, by definition, that would affect NATO states like Poland and also probably Germany. Um, there would be, you know, there would be weapons that, you know, that would go into Ukraine. There would be, you know, a lot of traffic back and forth between Ukraine and, and countries on the border. Um, and that would have a kind of both, I think, both destabilizing and galvanizing effect on the rest of Europe. Okay, well, Anne Applebaum, writer for The Atlantic and historian, thank you very much for analyzing that for us. Thanks so much. Thank you.